Prima Media's Mining Weekly is talking to Sheila Karma, a non-executive director of Tullow Oil and the Metals Company, and a former CEO of De Beers Botswana and a former director of Debswana. Sheila, you're hearing so much these days about critical metals and their supply constraints. But firstly, before we talk about them, what do we mean really by critical metals? Yeah, I think this is an important question to uh, answer because it's not self-evident. So when we speak about critical minerals, we are talking about metallic substances whose supply is critical to a particular industrial innovation or particular industrial development phase in our economic development. That's what we mean, that for us to achieve that end state industrially, the contribution of those minerals is central. That's basically what we mean by a mineral being critical. It is not inherent and it is not in the nature of any one specific mineral. And what is the difference, Sheila, between critical minerals and rare earth's elements? So some people, uh, when you listen to them speak, they use critical minerals and rare earths as being interchangeable. Uh, the first thing is that they are not, though they are also not mutually exclusive. You could have some rare earth elements that are critical to some development. But rare earths themselves really are part of, if you think about your school days, the periodic table, and they sit in the purple space. Uh, they are rare, not because they are rare in their occurrence, but they are rare because they very rarely occur in economically feasible quantities, and they include substances like plutonium. And they tend also to have certain qualities like being magnetic and, and have certain applications that are strategic, but they, they are not necessarily all critical in nature. So Sheila, does this mean that minerals are not inherently critical? Yes, it means that uh, minerals are not inherently critical. It means that uh, the critical nature of a mineral is driven by demand at and sometimes scarcity, and sometimes technological trends that suddenly put that mineral at the center of industrialization. So for instance, in our time, our minerals like nickel, manganese, cobalt, and lithium are critical for the decarbonization of the world's economy because they're critical to the manufacturing of batteries to store energy. They have become critical because we made a decision to move away and then somebody innovated. If this innovation changes and we can move from fossil fuel intensive energy sources to less fossil fuel energy intensive without the need to store energy in batteries, these minerals will cease to be critical and some other mineral or other substance may substitute them. And what do we know about Africa's endowment when it comes to critical minerals? Uh, the short answer is a lot, but also not enough. So this, what we know is that certain African countries are very well endowed with some of the critical minerals. In this respect, the DRC is second to none. The DRC is reputedly producing today up to 60% of cobalt, and cobalt is one of the critical minerals that we are looking at today. Uh, we also know that there's significant lithium deposits in uh, Zimbabwe. Guinea Conakry has massive high-grade deposits of uh, aluminum, et cetera, et cetera. But what we haven't done in recent times is undertaken sufficient exploration to know of the 53 other countries, what is the status? These are minerals that have been developed over years uh, and they just happen to now find themselves in the space of being critical. But cobalt, bauxite, lithium and others were already been mined before we got to where we are. What we don't know is if we explore who else might join those ranks. And what do you think uh, regional governments should do 
to benefit from the growing demand for these critical minerals? Well, the first thing is that uh, we, we need to understand that over the last 20 years or so, exploration expenditure in Africa relative, for instance, to Latin America, Asia, and Canada has dropped significantly. Now, exploration is in mining what R&D is in pharmaceuticals. You have no future if you have a pharmaceutical firm and you are not doing research and development because the pipeline of uh, new drugs will dry out. Uh, the same applies in mining. If you are not exploring the pipeline of discoveries of deposits uh, and those that are economically feasible will dry out. The result is that you have uh, very little mineral output. So that's the first point of departure. African governments need to counter the perception that the regulatory environments in the region are unstable and therefore unattractive for miners who take a long-term view. If we do this, then we will attract investment and with that investment, uh, have the discoveries to begin to benefit at least from the commodity trade. And are the benefits from the use of critical minerals to transition to cleaner sources of energy only confined to raw materials? No, as a matter of fact, because as I said, the critical nature of the minerals is just uh, a time and place in terms of technology and demand. But in effect, the value chain for these minerals is pretty much the same as any other, which is to say you start at the top with a commodity, you process it into a concentrate, uh, you then create a metal uh, substance out of it, and out of that you treat component parts for manufacturing. And as you do all this, the ripple effect economically is great. And so for African governments to benefit it, they have to be part of that ripple effect. And what else can be done, therefore, to increase benefits to beyond trading of the commodities? Well, quite apart from ensuring that the region is uh, competitive in terms of attracting exploration, one of the things that the governments have to do is really look at the, the issues today that impede manufacturing and industrialization. And in SADC, it's no secret, my grandma can tell you that uh, we suffer a significant uh, energy deficit. So it, it's a tough sell to try and get manufacturers to come to the region to process metals and manufacture in a place in which uh, load shading is the order of the day. So these processes, as you go downstream, are very, very uh, energy intensive. So we've got to plug in to this problem of uh, uh, energy deficit, but we also got to then uh, ramp up skills in terms of uh, TVET skills, digital technology, because manufacturing today operates in this space. So really there's a groundswell of uh, initiatives that need to be put in place capacity enhanced to be able to attract those who are going to manufacture the batteries and the cars. If we don't do that, they will go where those infrastructures exist. And what else is presently getting in the way of countries in Africa from benefiting in demand and growth of critical minerals? Well, uh, part of it is just innovation, you know, uh, the batteries, the electric vehicles, they are all designed and conceptualized elsewhere. And I think low scientific uh, and, and technology skills in the region, for us to come up with the same hubs that we have seen over the years, uh, as is the case with Silicon Valley, we can't always be dependent on other people. And the important thing uh, to realize, Martin, is this that actually these digital appliances and other related component parts in economic value, in cost, are much higher than the big trucks that we bring into the country. And so while most of us are looking at the physical nature of uh, industrial product, actually in today's days is the component parts that actually have higher economic value. We need to focus on that and to focus on that, our education system has to change 
to de deliver the type of skills necessary to plug into this uh, new uh, technological innovation called the fourth industrial revolution. And what do you think will be the overall impact of the growing demand for critical minerals on the mining industry itself? Well, you know, I, I have uh, been intrigued and sort of confirmed my suspicion that mining may well benefit from this growing demand for critical minerals, but not just benefit financially, but benefit in terms of the reputation of mining and the perception of mining as critical to our livelihoods. As you know, mining over the years has gotten a bad uh, name. My sense is that mining is about to get an opportunity to revisit and reposition itself as part of the solution rather than being the problem. And, and I think if mining plays is cut well, this uh, decarbonization is going to make mining not only relevant, but more accepted as part of the way we do business and not uh, the enemy of the state as it were. And do you see any countries that are already benefiting and, and why is it that these countries are benefiting if they are benefiting? So I, I haven't yet seen countries in the region that are benefiting directly from the decarbonization uh, in the mineral space. The countries that are benefiting were already uh, producing those substances like Zambia's copper, like the DRC's copper, like South Africa's manganese, and, and uh, for that matter, the coal that we spoke about. So I think that is just, the benefit there is just going to be scaling up rather than a change in any direction. The, the countries that are more likely to benefit in terms of just you know, starting from scratch are those that are like Mozambique and Tanzania because they have a huge deposit of gas and gas is considered the environmentally friendly uh, fossil fuel for transition and has been endorsed by the European uh, Union this way. And so those countries, the experience for them will be nearly transformational. And when you look into the immediate future, what do you envisage given the current trends? Well, uh, my genuine sense is this, that um, we are going to see a growth in the mining sector of an order of magnitude we haven't seen. I also think that we're going to find that the need for minerals is going to force uh, the world to think, if we can't get minerals on uh, shore, where else do we get them? Mm -hmm. Because think about it, Martin, when we think about the e-vehicles, when we think about the batteries, we are thinking about as much as 30 years of supply of metals based on today's demand. When we started to industrialize, we started with people being poor. And as we became more affluent, demand grew. We are affluent now. We want and can afford our cars now. We want and can afford our appliances now. We just want them wired differently. This is demand of the order of magnitude we have never seen. And, and therefore it is unlikely that uh, we have enough minerals to meet that demand. And so the question of where else do we fund them, I think, is the biggest question that we are yet to answer. That was Creamer Media's Mining Weekly, speaking to Sheila Karma, a non-executive director of Tallow Oil and the Metals Company, and former CEO of the Beers Botswana and former director of Debswana.